Hello everyone, I'm Nathan P. Butler, and this is my Star Wars vlog. The voice of reason, or lack thereof, as I've taken to calling it. This time I want to take a look at something that is a question that has been raised quite a bit over the span of the last few months, both on the Facebook pages for the Star Wars Timeline Gold, which you can find here, Facebook-wise, something I didn't share last time, or the last couple of times, uh, Star Wars Beyond the Films, also with its own Facebook page and such, uh, and just elsewhere in Star Wars conversations that I've been having, and that is this question of, okay, we're about a year and a half to two years, give or take, depending on which measurement you're using, into this new Star Wars canon, what I call story group canon, because it's canon driven by the story group, and the word canon has been used so many times in so many interchangeable, yet contradictory ways since, really, the early 90s with Star Wars, that even if you narrow it down and start saying, you know, G-Canon, C-Canon, T-Canon, the stuff that came later, um, even that terminology really kind of gets confusing to someone who is non-initiated, hasn't really looked into the different levels. Again, G, then T, then C, then S, then N, and all that stuff. And of course now, it's just called Canon! Because everything's supposed to be equal in this new continuity, which just begs the question, wait, Canon? What kind of Canon? What letters in front of that? There isn't one. It's all equal. It gets kind of confusing. So to me, calling it story group canon works. Some people call it new canon. Some call it Disney canon, whatever. But this new continuity. We're about two years into it, depending on your measurement. Are we talking about going back to Blade Squadron, the first prose fiction in it? Are we going back to A New Dawn, the first full-fledged novel in it? Are we harkening back to the beginning of Marvel's new stuff? Is it just going back to the announcement? A lot of different ways you can measure it. But we're about a year and a half, two years into it. And there's this question of, how does it compare to the Legends continuity? Legends is getting crapped on like crazy by those who are all about the new canon and all about Disney. And in some cases, we're just always haters of Legends and the old EU. While the new stuff is getting crapped on by a bunch of diehard Legends fans who say, this stuff is crap, we want Legends back, continue Legends, etc., etc. I know not all who say continue Legends are saying the new stuff is crap or quite as asinine as those dickheads who showed up at conventions and decided to go in and spoil The Force Awakens in various panels by shouting out spoilers because they want to continue Legends. Yes, because the best way to get a company to do something is to ingratiate yourself with them by being a piece of shit. Great idea. Usually doesn't work. I want to sort of dig down into this question of, well, how does it really compare to the Legends continuity overall but also to just those first few years of the Legends continuity, when it was getting going, how do we compare that to what's happening right now? So we're going to break it down into pieces. we got films, we got television, we've got books, we've got comics, we've got games. Games being video games and non-video games. Kind of the way that we break stuff down for Star Wars Beyond the Films. We do our year-in-review episodes of that podcast. Again, you can find Star Wars Beyond the Films... Cloud City Casino that I'm involved with, uh, Star Wars Reports, Rebels Roundtable, all at StarWarsReport.com. So, let's take a look at it. Let's start with movies. Okay? Now, obviously, the biggest news in Star Wars movies in a good long time was the release of The Force Awakens. Yes, this is a mini poster. It's one of those crappy little one-sided mini posters that are in that digital pre-order bundle that will eventually be part of our The Force Awakens coverage on From the Star Wars Home Video Library, also on this channel. But The Force Awakens being released and breaking all those box office records, that is huge. It's also the first foray into Star Wars on film outside of the original live-action movies. So here we are, basically with a new movie. Well, okay, how do we compare the movies of Legends to the movies of this new canon? And honestly, I would say the jury's sort of still out on this. We just don't have enough data to make the comparison. Because if you really get down to it, Remember, the way that they've created this new canon is to basically take the old G&T canon, the live-action films, and the Clone Wars, and sort of copy and paste it into a blank continuity, a blank document, that they've now built all this other stuff onto, including The Force Awakens. So, we're still dealing with the Blu-ray cuts, the 2011 cuts of the films for episodes 1 through 6, whether we're talking about story group canon or legends. It's still this version of The Phantom Menace. It's still this version of Attack of the Clones. It's still this version of Revenge of the Sith. Which are, of course, also collected here and here. And it's still this version of A New Hope. And this version of The Empire Strikes Back. And this version of Return of the Jedi. Which can also be found here 
and here. Which all collectively is a saga of six with bonus features can be found here or here. Wow, this is why there's a From the Star Wars Home Video Library series on this channel. There's a lot of these things. So basically what that means is that really the only significant difference from a live-action film standpoint is that Story Group Canon includes The Force Awakens and Legends doesn't. And yes, I did say live-action films, though technically the Clone Wars film fits into it as well, which you can find here, or here, or here, or here, or here. My point being, since that is the only difference, it's kind of hard to really make a comparison. I mean, for the most part, they're essentially the same. I would argue that The Force Awakens is a positive step for Star Wars films. It's got a lot of the energy that you get from the original trilogy. It opens up a lot of new possibilities. It opens up some actual new cliffhangers and such. But people are very divided. There's those who love The Force Awakens, those who hate The Force Awakens. Those who say it's too much like A New Hope, those who say, nope, that's just rips and that's what Lucas did. So it makes perfect sense for it to have some parallels to A New Hope and it's really different in other ways. In fact, that'll probably wind up being a different vlog here uh, at some point down the line. Point being that there's so much division that I think we probably need to see Episode 8 and Rogue One and you know some other live-action films to really get a chance to say, is there a significant quality difference between Legends films and canon films? Because there is so much overlap. If you were just going on new production versus old, then again, it would be kind of an unfair comparison because we'd be comparing one film versus six or seven if you count the Clone Wars. So we'll have to leave the discussion of the movie quality and how it compares for another time. That then brings us to television. Well, the Legends continuity is going to include the <laughs> holiday special. Yes, that's a VHS bootleg. It's the only way you can get it because there is no legal way because even Lucas went, oh! when it was done. You have the Ewok telemovies found here and here, or here and here, or just here. None of those are really TV series, though. They're more like specials. They're essentially one-offs. You've got the Droids TV series, which can be found here, in the double-length versions here, as a bastardized movie version here, and two bastardized movie versions here. Of course, that whole series has never been released in the United States. Then, of course, you have the Ewok cartoon series that ran for two seasons, which you can find in part here, on the double-length versions here, in one rather bastardized film version here made up of four episodes, or an even more bastardized version alongside it with four more episodes. You then had the Clone Wars micro-series, and I'm not going to try to pick them all up, there's so many of them. We have the Clone Wars. Five seasons on Cartoon Network, one season on Netflix. Now, broadly speaking, there is certainly a larger volume produced for the Legends continuity, or prior to the reboot. Then, of course, we have New Canon, or Story Group Canon, which has the Clone Wars and Rebels in it. I would argue that their storytelling prowess has gotten better on television, particularly in the realm of cartoons. Uh, Clone Wars microseries was relatively short, uh, decent, but relatively short. Not really something we can judge as a full-scale television series. Same can be said, really, for the Ewok telemovies and the holiday special. They're not really television series, per se. Uh, we could compare to Ewoks and droids. Droids felt like Star Wars at times. Other times it felt like generic science fiction. And it was kind of goofy. It was meant for little kids. Uh, Ewoks. Kind of goofy, meant for little kids. You can really tell it was made by Nelvana, the company that made Care Bears. Yes, that's true, uh, if you didn't know that already. And... Thank the Maker if the only Ewoks you have ever seen are on those home video releases. Because those are all from Season 1. When Season 2 came around, they completely changed that show to make it even dumber, even more for little kids, and they butchered, actually probably murdered is a, a good way of saying it, they butchered or murdered the personalities of most of the characters, changing them completely. Wicket went from the, the good heroic lad to an arrogant little prick. Uh, Tebow. Went from being the wise sorcerer's apprentice who is gaining in wisdom beyond his years to being a lovesick, bumbling idiot who can't hardly ever do anything right. Latara, Barrett's favorite, shout out there to Barrett from Rebels Roundtable. Um, Latara went from being someone who is essentially lovestruck over Tebow, yet Tebow is so oblivious to her, to being a complete and utter skank 
who basically is throwing her sexuality, yes, in a kid's show, around and manipulating Tebow into doing stuff he doesn't want to do simply by playing off of his emotions. She kind of became a little bitch. So, not really sure that droids and Ewoks are a good measure for quality cartoon storytelling for Star Wars. If we're going to make the comparison, it needs to be the Clone Wars versus Rebels. And in that sense, I think Rebels is benefiting from all the lessons learned from Clone Wars. Um, you don't have Lucas's direct involvement, so you don't get these random story pitch ideas that are that you can't really say no to if you're the showrunners, but you're sitting back saying, the fuck is he talking about? Like, hey, there's this artist, right, named Mobius, and he's got these, these paintings that just... They just make me think of nothingness and the void. So we should have episodes where they're like all contemplating the void and suicide and stuff on this barren world. And God, George, no! But nobody says no, so we get the crap of a sunny day in the void and the broader droid arc that is built around it. Um, the Clone Wars was based on characters except for Ahsoka and Rex that for the most part we already knew the fates of. We knew what was going to happen to Obi-Wan and Anakin and Yoda and Mace and so on and Palpatine and Dooku, and Grievous, that there really couldn't be a lot of suspense in that story. You could have different things happen that were surprising to other characters, but for the most part, we knew where their character arcs were going, and nothing really major could happen to any of those major film characters. Really, Ahsoka was the only one we had to pin our hopes on for character development outside of, to a degree, Rex. Um... You had a series that was telling stories eventually as sort of mini-movies, the little story arcs. That actually worked, I think, very well to, still, to tell arcs of about four episodes at a time. thing about it, though, is that those arcs rarely felt like they connected to each other. You never really had the sense that a season of The Clone Wars was a big story, or that The Clone Wars television series was a big story. Instead, it felt like each little block of stories was a story in and of itself. It was also a series that, because of... Uh, resources in the beginning told a lot of stories out of order. The chronology of seasons one, two, and the first half of three of the Clone Wars is an absolute mess. Not counting the crap that happened when they took the wrecking ball to the existing continuity of the Clone Wars. I'm just talking about the order of the fucking episodes in the order that they were aired versus what they're supposed to be in. So Clone Wars was sort of a mess in the beginning, got much stronger as it went along, but had all these things waiting against it. But they learned a lot. And now what we have with Rebels is a story with new characters whose fates we don't know. We're interested in seeing where they go, and they're picking up some of the characters who were original from the Clone Wars to see where they go, so their stories can still develop. We are getting appearances by film characters, but they're not major characters, so we don't have to worry about it interfering with things or saying, oh, well, they're going to put this character in trouble even though we know what's going to happen to them. And you've got a story that really feels like sometimes there are minor arcs, and there are bigger arcs of the whole season, and the entire show feels like one long adventure of these characters. They have learned to do TV drama well as a cartoon for Star Wars. So my argument would be that from the standpoint of, well, how does the old version of television show making pre-reboot compare to post-reboot? Post-reboot kicks the crap out of the earlier version. Rebels is by far a better produced show and a stronger show than Clone Wars ever was. And, by extension, than Ewoks and Droids and all those other ones were. So, that's a place where they've really nailed it with this new continuity. Unfortunately, it may be the only place they've really nailed it. That brings us into books. Now, full disclosure, I do get the review copies, so a lot of times I get a chance to see the books before they actually hit the market. But I also wind up buying these at retail, if there's not a review retail copy that is sent down. I'm a collector of these things. I collected all the Legends ones, now I'm collecting all the new canon ones as they're coming out. So, I've been reading these like crazy, I use them, of course, uh, to put together things like the Star Wars Timeline Gold, reference right there, um, which gives me a chance to sort of piece it together and see what the big picture is of Star Wars. And I kind of feel like right now there's not a lot of big picture going on for what we're seeing with the new books. One place they are still doing fairly well is guidebooks. You have things like the visual dictionaries, incredible cross-sections, visual guides and whatnots for the TV shows. Those are pretty solid. But what gets me in the comparison, if we are going to compare Legends to Canon, 
One is the obvious, right? And the one that we really can't fault canon for at this point, and that is the fact that it doesn't span as much time, right? It's not as epic in terms of time scale as the Legends continuity was. Well, why? Because the Legends continuity had decades to develop, to give us stories set 4,000, 5,000 years before the film, then 3,000 or so years before the film, and even further back to the beginning of the Force on Tython and so forth, the Dawn of the Jedi, and then we have stories taking place you know, leading up to the films, between the films, after the films, going all the way up to jumping decades to give us something like Legacy, 100 plus years in the future of the films, and so on. There really hasn't been time for story group canon to dig into anything like that. So in that sense, we can't fault it that much for the fact that from a temporal standpoint, a time standpoint, so far story group canon severely lacks in temporal diversity compared to Legends. But again, I think a big part of that is because they're focusing in on the characters around the films because they're trying to develop the core of this new continuity before they branch out too much. That said, there's a distinct flaw I find in most of the books so far released for the new canon, story group canon. It started out with A New Dawn. This is that uh, celebration advance copy that you could only get at the celebration that basically spoiled the book months ahead of time. And of course, there's the book itself. A New Dawn worked really well to give us some insight into Kanan and show us how Kanan and Hera started working together in the first place. Are there epic events that have grand ramifications? Not really. Uh, we get to meet Vidian, who shows up in some other stories, and Ray Sloan, who becomes almost like a Talon card or a Mara Jade type figure in that she shows up constantly in all kinds of different stories. But is it an epic tale of galactic proportions, something on the level of, and I think it's a fair comparison, Heir to the Empire, the first prose fiction novel of the Legends continuity back in 1991? Not even close. It's not designed to be that. It's a character story, not this grand, sprawling, epic story. By the same token, you have Chuck Wendig's Aftermath, the first new canon novel to be set after Return of the Jedi, which again makes frequent comparison between it and Heir to the Empire because of their place essentially in the publishing lines. Um, aside from the fact that it's completely full of more sentence fragments than a fifth grader's homework, um, again, there's nothing really epic about Aftermath. We expected this of all of them, to be an epic novel showing us what's happening in the galaxy after Return of the Jedi. Instead, it's a bunch of characters we really have never met or really cared about that just happens to have one that's a kid who shows up as an adult, Snap Wexley, in The Force Awakens. It's got Ray Sloan back, but it's a bunch of talking around a table. It's a small rebel group doing their thing on a planet we've never heard of or cared about, with characters we've never really heard of or cared about, with a hell of a lot of controversy, for a book that has very little impact on anything so far. We got Tarkin, which gives great detail on the origin of Tarkin and the development of Tarkin's character. I feel like I connect more with the Tarkin character than I ever have before, and I really dig the detail that we got on him. But again, is this story something that matters in the grand scheme of things? Doesn't really feel like it does. It's a character study without any kind of galactic, epic, large-scale impact. Those two, of course, that is A New Dawn and Tarkin, are also in that Rise of the Empire omnibus with three other short stories. Good short stories, but again, not sure about the impact. Although, seeing Rey Sloan at the Battle of Endor, that's kind of a cool thing. And the fact that she is at the Battle of Endor, we get to see it from her perspective, does add new light to that character. I would argue that the short stories in here make this worth purchasing. But again, character studies, not epic. Lords of the Sith. Good character study getting inside the head of Vader. Better than we've seen before getting inside the head of Vader. Uh, we get to see Chum Syndulla and see some development for him between the Clone Wars and when we see him again in Rebels. But epic? Grand scale? No. Again, it's just a character study. Heir to the Jedi. They bring in Kevin Hearn, the author of the Iron Druid series. It's a story based on Luke. It's first person, which is unusual for Star Wars. It's only happened a few times really in the past. But what does it wind up doing for us? It basically lets us find out that Luke learns how to use telekinesis by first moving a noodle. Okay. And hey, he can have a sexual attraction to someone other than his sister. Galactic proportions, not so much. 
We do get one that's kind of a cheat in a sense, and that's Dark Disciple. Dark Disciple left me in tears almost at the very end of it. It's a very good story to round out the story of Asajj Ventress and give us some greater depth to the canonical version of Quinlan Voss. But it's kind of a cheat because this is based on unproduced episodes of The Clone Wars. So in a sense, it's part of the television series almost as much as it is a novel in and of itself. Very heavy on character study. Great impact. Not any more so than virtually any other arc of The Clone Wars. And let's not forget Battlefront Twilight Company, meant to help promote the game of the same name. This is a Battlefront story. The game isn't at all a Battlefront story because it has no story content to speak of. This is actually a very good book about the, the trials and travails of warfare and the toll that it takes on a person and a team. But again, even with its heavy, heavy combat, it's still not a particularly epic story. It's again, basically a character study. I'm not saying that character studies are bad. I think it's important we get into these characters' heads and we get some depth to them because a lot of times in the Legends continuity, we had characters show up and do their thing in a story without really ever feeling like the characters changed or evolved because of the impact of that particular story. So yes, more detailed character studies are necessary. And I think that's also what we're getting with the Rebels cartoon series relative to what we got in the Clone Wars. But at some point, we have to have something epic, something big happening. And so far, we haven't gotten that. I think that's a big difference between this early story group canon and the early Legends continuity. You go back to 91 through about, I'd say about 98, let's say. Let's take the time from when it started to when I graduated from high school. Um, you had the Thrawn trilogy. You had the Jedi Academy trilogy. You had Tales of the Jedi. You had Dark Empire. You had all these major events happening, and every single one of them had something major in galactic history happening. Some new threat, some new huge war or something, usually a super weapon added, a super weapon of the week sort of became the joke at the time. Um, major turning points, major revelations about the development of these characters after Return of the Jedi in most cases, or the history of the galaxy in this far-flung time period that was really sort of an experiment in Star Wars storytelling. We get none of that in the books as they exist for story group canon right now. There are no trilogies. There are no duologies. They're just individual books so far that are character studies that, yes, have a tapestry attached to them, kind of they weave in with other materials, but they don't feel like they have a heavy impact on other materials. Like, you couldn't have the Jedi Academy trilogy without Dark Empire and the Thrawn trilogy. You know, they had the impact to them on other things. Most of these books could exist without the others, and you would never know the difference. And that's not necessarily a good thing. They're creating things that amount to a shared universe, but not really a broader, bigger storyline. At least it doesn't feel like it just yet. So in turning away from the big epic storylines and into more personal stories, I know it's a stylistic choice, but for someone who grew up with the Legends continuity, I think this is why, in a large degree, there's a lot of people who are not happy, who are Legends fans, who are not happy with the new books because there isn't anything really epic about them. Give us a major event that's not gonna be in a live action movie. Give us something that evokes the Thrawn trilogy, the Hand of Thrawn duology, the Jedi Academy trilogy, hell, the Black Fleet Crisis, the Corellian trilogy. Give us stories that feel like the galaxy is on the brink and we need our heroes to save it, rather than saving their own butts. Because so far, that feels like it's all that we've gotten. We've gotten some other very strong things. I mean, we've gotten Before the Awakening, which was a good lead-in to The Force Awakens, oddly enough, with no journey to The Force Awakens on the top of it. We've got the three books that are a quasi-series, you might say, but only as loosely connected as Empire and Rebellion was meant to be before that wound up getting shifted around with Razor's Edge and everything. But we had Weapon of a Jedi, Luke's first real lightsaber duel. We had Smuggler's Run, introducing basically one of the background characters that we were going to see in The Force Awakens. And we had Moving Target, which actually gives us some bridge material between The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, the closest thing we have in this era to a Shadows of the Empire. They were all quite good. Again, character studies, though, without major galactic impact, minus perhaps Moving Target. I would argue the single best book we've gotten at all of the story group canon stuff so far is this unassuming sucker right here. Lost Stars, essentially a Romeo and Juliet story, except, again, I think that that's sort of 
does it a disservice. I've always looked at Romeo and Juliet as kind of a cautionary tale rather than a romance because the kids in it, Romeo, Juliet, and the others are so freaking stupid in what they're doing that it really doesn't work for me as a romance. It never has, despite me being a big Shakespeare guy. Um, great, great story. Told for young audiences. Told for essentially young adults, not as an adult novel. Spans a long period of time. We really get to know the characters. They develop well. And we have some very important emotional clashes throughout the book. This is the closest thing we have to feeling epic in current Star Wars story group canon. It's not really meant to be epic in scale per se, but it feels like it because of how much we see of the lifetime of these characters and the meaningful nature of these events that they go through. For the galaxy at large, maybe to an extent because it shows the Battle of Jakku, but that's about it. We've also had plenty of young reader books. We had things like Ezra's Gamble, which basically um, is a lead-in to uh, Rebel's first episode. We got Rebellion Begins, which is an adaptation of it. We got Ray's Story, which is another way of looking at The Force Awakens. We've got Ray's Survival Guide to Living on Jakku, which is kind of a, a personal anecdote-filled journal that gives us a little bit of background of the character. We've got uh, Ezra's Rebel Journal, which is pretty much the same thing for Ezra. Sabine's Sketchbook, pretty much the same thing for Sabine. Interestingly, the only real series that we've gotten that focuses on one set of characters and really delves into them and gives them a huge arc for themselves is Jason Fry's Servants of the Empire, a four-book series focusing on Zare Leonis, who first appeared in Star Wars Rebels. Or wonder what was up with that whole thing about him looking for his sister? It's not being resolved on the show. It's already resolved. It's resolved right here. And, of course, you got your weird adaptations of the films and your various adaptations of The Force Awakens. Oh, look! Extra pages. One's hardback, one's not. Lots of different variants to these things. Again, they're not bad books. There's some quality stuff here. But very personal stories that lack that galactic scale, that broader, more epic scale that we came to expect from decades of the Legends continuity. No wonder people who are expecting that type of epic storytelling are being put off by these books because they are very, very different in their focus and their tone. I think that at this point, Legends still has it up on story group canon because even in those first years of Legends, we got those epic stories and personal stories. We got Tales of the Jedi in an unexplored era along with the ones with characters we were familiar with. It doesn't really feel like the experimentation is really going on right now with story group canon, at least not yet. Now, putting one topic about the books, The Journey to the Force Awakens, on hold for just a second, that brings us into the comics. And the comics, unfortunately, are kind of the same way. There's not a lot of epic storytelling, and there's a whole lot of cliche and bad storytelling going on in what we're getting. In comparison to the early days of the Legends continuity, where we had stuff like Dark Empire and Tales of the Jedi and such. Granted, we also had the reprints of the newspaper strips as classic Star Wars, but it felt like there was some risk-taking going on, there were some epic stories being told, and there were some events that were important showing up within those stories. You felt like you wanted to make sure you read it because you didn't want to miss something major in the galaxy far, far away. Now, let's start with the current comics by looking at the miniseries, because that's where we can find some real ooh, mm -hmm, um, unpleasantness. The first miniseries from Marvel so far, Princess Leia. Um, Princess Leia, in that it's supposed to be the character, in that it's a character in her position, does it feel like Leia? God, no. As I said over and over and over again during the review of this on Star Wars Beyond the Films, that's not Leia! Because she doesn't act like herself. The fact that Leia has a whole monologue in an issue here that basically summarizes into... And she uses this exact phrase, the, the latter part of what I'm about to say, something along the lines of, well, I would do something and I would save the day if things would just stop going wrong for like two seconds. She actually uses the if stuff would stop going wrong for like two seconds kind of line at the end of the monologue. That's not the Leia that we know. This is Leia acting her age. Not necessarily a good thing given how Leia has always acted much more mature than a 19-year-old would be. No offense to all the 19-year-olds out there. But seriously, we had a Leia miniseries that sets up very little, that leaves us more questions like, really? Seriously? At what point did they put together this big sculpture of Leia's parents on Yavin 4 in memoriam to them? When did they have time to do that? And when you're giving a speech 
as part of that celebration that we see at the end of A New Hope, is there some reason why you would talk about the losses on Alderaan and your parents, but not ever once mention the loss of the various pilots who just died in the Battle of Yavin? Wow. Yeah, really, really bad characterization of Leia here in this series by Mark Wade. Honestly, my favorite thing about it is this question of her buddy's clothes, okay? Because you see, her traveling companion is wearing the same clothes that Luke wears at the celebration on Yavin 4. Which begs the question, well, did she raid Luke's closet and take the same clothes? Are these standard clothing? But then you stop back and think, well, wait a second, no, because Luke showed up with just the clothes on his back after leaving Tatooine. So maybe it's the other way around. Maybe Luke needed something fresh and spiffy to wear to the award ceremony, and he raided someone's closet and stole her clothes, Evan's clothes, only not realizing he was wearing women's clothes the entire time that he was at the ceremony. So we may have an instance here of Star Wars cross-dressing, and we haven't even known it since 1977, but it's right there in front of our face. When Leia ended, we got Lando. Lando's actually not too bad. Again, it doesn't feel like it connects to anything at all, really. But it gives us Lando. We get to see him in adventure alongside Labot. It sets up a situation with Labot that might wind up being referred to later, hopefully. Um, but it becomes a major instance of one of the biggest failings of what's happening right now with the story group. Story group is doing a good job telling personal stories and sort of filling in things that we need to know about characters as they develop them more in other media as well, like in Rebels. But, chronologically, they're really not doing a good job of pinning things down and giving us any sense of where it really takes place. This one, for example, when does Lando take place? It takes place between The New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, awesome, great, that's a three-year stretch. When does Lando take place? Well, we don't know. We kind of want to leave it open so that other storytellers aren't stepping on each other's toes as they come in and try to write in that same era with similar characters. You don't think that's going to wind up with some serious continuity clashes at some point down the line? That scares the shit out of me as someone who saw some of the clashes when stories were being written around the same time and clashing with each other in the Legends continuity. I don't want to see those kind of messes in story group canon. Yet... We have instances where stories are being told without really any sense of when in a large time span they take place. You take these Star Wars stories from Marvel in the regular Star Wars comic book series. You take uh, Weapon of a Jedi. You take Heir to the Jedi. The writers didn't know when they took place in relation to one another when they were writing. It was just a matter of being able to figure out, okay, in this story, Luke says he hasn't heard Obi-Wan's voice since Yavin. In this story, he does, so this must take place after that other one. It's that kind of reasoning to try to figure out when these things are taking place. I was expecting something a lot more concrete when we got the reboot, but it hasn't happened. After Lando, we got a bit of a turd, a Wookiee-sized turd this time. The Chewbacca miniseries. It's great that Chewbacca is getting his own miniseries here. He didn't even have to die this time to get it, like he did back when Dark Horse was over the franchise's uh, comics. The thing about it, though, is if you're going to have a story based around a character who can't speak basic, and you're not ever going to translate it, you need to do something more than the Lassie Syndrome, where you've got this girl, who kind of looks like a little boy, but whatever, um, as this main character, this main character alongside Chewbacca, who frankly, we don't care about her, we don't care about her planet, we don't care about her family, we are given no reason to care about them, other than they're just like, they're major characters, you must care. No, sorry. Give me an actual reason to care other than this happens to be the kid that met Chewbacca, okay? Oh, he's going to give the kid the medal? Wonderful. Give us a reason to care other than that. Give us a, a reason to remember the character other than that. Um, and what you get here is basically a whole lot of, 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 what's that, Chewbacca? Timmy fell down the well kind of storytelling. It's not a good story. It's not told well. They don't use Chewbacca well, although he is consistent with his character at least, but holy crap, what were they thinking? So far, the miniseries, not so great when they're character-focused. The books, at least when they're character-focused, have really been rocking the characterization. The miniseries, barring Lando, that was pretty decent, when it comes to Chewbacca and Princess Leia, they fired off and tried to give us a character-centered story that would be great for character development that either went off one way with Chewbacca and never felt like it developed squat and we really didn't care and the last few pages made no damn sense whatsoever because there's no narration or dialogue 
or with Leia, zips off and somehow gives us a story about Leia who's nothing like Leia. That brings us to another miniseries. Four issues this time. Shattered Empire. This one I like. This was a story that was set in the waning hours of the Battle of Endor, working its way through the time period heading up towards the Battle of Jakku. It introduces two rebel characters that are interesting, particularly one that's interesting, um, that wind up being the parents of Poe Dameron, we wind up finding out. So there's a connection to The Force Awakens, hence Journey to the Force Awakens. It lets us see the Empire fracturing and what they're doing in that year after the Battle of Endor, once the Emperor is gone and Vader is gone. It's got solid artwork. It's decent storytelling, although in the last issue, this whole weird thing about them going after a couple of trees from the old Jedi Temple just kind of comes out of left field. But in general, it's a pretty solid series. But that series brings us back to the boop, time out, going away, which is the Journey to the Force Awakens. If you're going to have a product line called Journey to the Force Awakens, it needs to actually feel like it's a journey to the Force Awakens. Return of the Jedi here, Force Awakens here, give us a story that's going to take us from one to the other. Fill in that gap. Instead, the Journey to the Force Awakens, for the most part, should have been called Journey to the Force Awakens through meeting background characters you'll only see for a split second on screen, if at all, that you will have no reason to care about later, even after reading these stories. I don't think that all would have fit on the cover, but that's basically what we got. All of the Journey to the Force Awakens stuff, for the most part, felt like it might as well have been Tales from the Most Icy Cantina type side stories that really never felt like it was actually a journey to the Force Awakens. We got decades of story to fill, and we get a few months worth, and even some stories that don't really feel like they fit at all into a product line called Journey to the Force Awakens. Very, very frustrating. I'm hoping they don't do this with Rogue One, they don't do this with Episode Eight, but who knows. Either way, though, Shattered Empire turns out well, but man, that label on that comic has got to go. Ironically, again, the one story that truly feels like it's the Journey to the Force Awakens is the book Before the Awakening. And oh yeah, Before the Awakening doesn't have the Journey to the Force Awakens label on it. I would call that Journey to the Force Awakens label at least, not the products under it, but the label a true epic fail. Also in miniseries, we do have the Obi-Wan and Anakin series, but it hasn't gone very far yet, so jury's still out. We also had a sort of maxi series, a series that ran for two arcs, Kanan, The Last Padawan. Again, a story that gives us a lot of great background detail on Kanan, his first missions and how he becomes the Padawan of Depa Bilaba, and then his experiences around Order 66 and how he became Kanan Jarrus rather than Caleb Doom. Works great if we care about the character of Kanan. I think if it was anybody else, we probably wouldn't have cared, but works well for background of Kanan. Solid story. Again, though, not telling epic stories, telling very personal, individual, character-focused stories, which is a different approach. And that brings us to the ongoing series. We've got Star Wars, and we have Darth Vader. So far, Star Wars and Darth Vader have been odd. Uh, very good artwork in some cases. With Star Wars, we've gotten arcs that really haven't felt like they've been major game changers in any way but good, solid Star Wars action. However, we do have a couple of things about Star Wars, the ongoing series, that just grate against the fabric of my soul. Places where I think Marvel needs to be probably smacked across the face a couple of times. First is sales numbers and covers. Marvel put out Star Wars number one with, and this is not an exaggeration, if you include regular variant covers, later reprinted variant covers, and comic shop exclusive variant covers, Star Wars number one was released with over 100 different covers for a single issue. Needless to say, they broke sales records. And yes, this was an issue that probably would have broken sales records anyway. But when you've got over 100 fucking variant covers, it's going to wind up inflating your sales numbers. So I have a really hard time looking at them saying, look, Marvel has Star Wars. Star Wars is back with Marvel. Ladies and gentlemen, we're number one. And not thinking we're number one because they inflated their sales numbers by the fact that you have so many people out there picking up multiple copies because of these tons of variant covers. I got friends trying to find all of them. It's ridiculous. I would really like to see sales numbers for Star Wars number one, but I, they, I, they can't derive them, I'm sure that would actually boil it down to how many different individuals bought at least one copy, period. Not how many bought many, 
Not how many did you sell across this hundred plus set of variants, but how many people consumed your product, period. And then compare those sales numbers to sales numbers of other comics that it's being compared to that only launched with one cover, one variant for people to actually purchase. That grates on the fabric of my soul. If you need a f***ing trade paperback, to include all your covers, it's too damn many covers. The second thing that ongoing Star Wars did that grates on the fabric of my soul, though, is this lady right here. Sana Solo. Sana Solo was introduced during the first arc, and it's this shocking moment. Holy shit. Han Solo is married? And of course, you have the, the people out there who are looking for all the, the, the racial divide in the culture going, Oh my god, he's married to a black woman? Whatever. Han Solo's married? Sana Solo? What is this all about? And it's blowing up. It's clickbait everywhere. And we're sitting back here thinking, No way. It's too obvious. There is no way that these people, after just getting the license, are going to make this turn out to be some kind of sitcom, BS, crappy, it's a misunderstanding, or we were married through some ritual that wasn't real, or we had to sign marriage papers for some legal reason, or, you know, something like that. It was a con. There's no way, after just getting the license, they're going to pull something like this, get all this media hype, and then have it turn out to be that lame. No way are they going to do that. Apparently, we underestimated Marvel's penchant for the cliché. Because what we were afraid was going to be cliché, crappy, sitcom bullshit turned out to be cliché, crappy, sitcom bullshit! Exactly what we feared it was going to be. She's not his wife. She was a partner on a scam and they had to act as husband and wife and now she came back claiming to be the wife for some damn reason. Because she wanted to get the money back and didn't want to tell the truth about who she was. Maybe she just wanted to screw with Leia's mind. Cliché, sitcom, crappy bullshit. In the first arc, stretched out as a plot point into and through the second arc until we learn the truth and the truth turns out to be just as lame as we feared it would be when they introduced it. But we gave them credit that they wouldn't do that kind of crap this early in a series and delve that much into the cliché... Uh, friends Seinfeld type realm. But no, Marvel, we should give you more credit than that. You really are full of cliche bullshit. So decent Star Wars stories, though nothing amazing, and a couple of things to simply pull your hair out about. Now, Darth Vader, on the other hand, Darth Vader's going very well. Uh, well, it was going very well. Darth Vader brings us not so much a lot of great Vader action, though it does. It's a lot of good Vader action. We've seen Vader being a badass plenty of times before, especially in things like Dark Times and Purge back in the Legends continuity. But what it brings us is Dr. Aphra and the droids, uh, two completely homicidal droids, perhaps cousins of Chopper, who are from the Tarkin Initiative, who are just hilarious in how much they just want to kill things. And Aphra, she's a little screwed up. I mean, this is someone who is just excited and just loving the opportunity to work with Vader, even though it might mean her death. It's the best job ever. Those new characters are fantastic and very, very engaging. Are they really going anywhere with that story in Darth Vader where it's going to get epic or more interesting? We don't know. The first arc was pretty good, but it's bringing that team together. The second arc was kind of blah. It's just sort of, how does Vader find out a little bit more about the fact that he had a kid survive? Okay. With all this other stuff going on in the background, it really doesn't feel like it meant a whole heck of a lot. So, jury's kind of out on where Darth Vader is going to go, but so far it's got very good art, some really cool characters introduced in it. But again, not epic storytelling. Nothing of the grand scale. It's all still kind of compact around the original trilogy in this case, and telling stories with mostly characters that we know, in this case, finally adding some interesting ones that we didn't know before. The biggest hype in the comics for a while was this. Vader Down, a crossover. Basically, Vader Down was kind of like Age of Apocalypse. You have different series, different things crossing into each other, but to start it off, you have a separate story. No separate story to end it this time, though. And it made for an interesting concept, I suppose, Vader crashes into Luke. They both wind up on the surface uh, of a planet. You've got uh, Aphra and some Imperials trying to hunt down Luke. 
You've got Vader trying to hunt down Luke and take on the Rebels, but at the same time, Vader is being hunted by the Rebels and is going to have to face off almost an entire Rebel army single-handedly. Big confrontation coming. Believe it or not, even something like that, they couldn't pull off epic. Instead, it was just a knockdown drag out with these characters that happen to be from different comic series that happen to be interweaving between the comic series. It's very hard to do a crossover in Star Wars after we spent so many years with the Legends continuity and have it feel a crossover because we're used to this idea of a shared universe. Of course, characters from this comic series can show up in this other one. You don't need a crossover to do that. They just do. Marvel felt like they needed a crossover to make that happen and to build up some hype, which they did. But they gave us another story that, even while being bigger and more bombastic, still wasn't particularly epic. Still didn't reach the scale of a lot of the stories we had with Legends, particularly early on. So again, it's that same thing that's happening with the comics. Although there's many more crappy comics coming from Marvel than there are crappy novels coming from Del Rey. I mean, the stuff that's coming from Del Rey and from Disney Press are actually pretty solid uh, for the most part. The comics are a really mixed bag here. But again, the epic scale, the idea of the galaxy in conflict doesn't really shine through very much in the comics. The feeling that these characters are in real peril because of who they are and when this is don't really feel like they're in real peril at all. They need more original characters in these stories. They need more real peril for them in the stories. And they need different events of galactic consequence to possibly be happening to give us those dots to connect between, say, A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. So far, they're not doing that, so it feels much more akin to Marvel's original run on Star Wars, albeit of much higher quality, than it does anything like what we got in, say, 1991 through, you know, 1995-ish coming from Dark Horse. Very different approaches to the product line in these two different eras of publishing. And that brings us to the games. From a non-video game standpoint, we're actually kind of in a great time for Star Wars games. Because you've got the role-playing game uh, from Fantasy Flight Games, which has one of the coolest role-playing game systems that I've ever seen in terms of the way that the dice work and whatnot. You've got three different parallel lines. You've got Age of Rebellion, Edge of the Empire, and uh, Force and Destiny to give you different takes on the galaxy. All kinds of great supplements coming out with lots of great information. The downside to that is that the games now aren't necessarily being meant to be part of continuity. We're being told they're essentially going to be open to including all kinds of information, whether it's legends or canon or both, and they're just meant to be authentic, not necessarily in one continuity or another. The downside to that is that we can't really judge them as part of the canon timeline or of the legends timeline. They're just sort of there. But they're very solid products. We've got uh, great miniatures games, three of them for Fantasy Flight at this point. We've got X-Wing, Armada, and Imperial Assault. I personally prefer X-Wing. You've got the card game, the LCG, and you've even got Empire vs. Rebellion, which is just that little tiny uh, CIA vs. KGB reskin card game for Fantasy Flight. The Star Wars non-video games are extremely solid these days. I would argue maybe in a renaissance of that type of gaming for Star Wars. I just wish that it was built for one continuity or the other, those that set of product lines. That said, video games? Oh, how the mighty have fallen. There was an era in which Star Wars video games were groundbreaking. X-Wing, TIE Fighter, uh, Dark Forces, Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2. These games that were coming out that were blowing people away with their prowess and what they could do with the technology, and they were fun games, and they told really good Star Wars stories, that were then part of the Legends continuity and could be built off of and play into events happening within that continuity. Now what do we have? We have a whole bunch of little app games with no story whatsoever. We have one app game that tries to tell a solid story, but because of its nature being very grindy, that is Star Wars Uprising, its story is very drawn out, but at least it's trying to tell a story, a cohesive story, in video game form, You've got the Disney Infinity stuff that's telling these non-continuity alternate versions of the films, which granted are very fun. You can watch my live streams of all of them on this channel here. Um, very fun, for the most part, but that aren't adding to one continuity or another and do require a lot of outside purchases for those other figures and whatnot. But of course, the biggest Star Wars video game in years was Battlefront. A game released, it's extremely bare bones, 
there's no story whatsoever. It's very light on progression, character development, content, modes, you name it, by any measure of anything but graphics and sound. In the modern first-person shooter or third-person shooter genre, Battlefront is woefully lean on content and has itself some nice overpriced DLC to add more content that still doesn't add a lot of depth to the game. Uh, I do a, a live stream on Battlefront, and I'm running out of things to talk about because there's just not much to this game. So from the standpoint of regular games, non-video games, we're at a great high point relative to what we had with Legends for quite a bit of Legends existence. Whereas for video games, we're in a dark time, so to speak, when it comes to that compared to the Legends era. Even when we were getting crappy games like Bombad Racing, at least they were trying to give us a story even if it didn't make sense for Bombad Racing. Hell, Masters of Terrace Kasi had a freaking story. Not Battlefront. No, we don't need a story. You just want to kill each other. Go, kitties, kill, play. We'll be back here taking in all of your cash. I'm waiting for the Visceral Games Star Wars game to finally be released, because that one, at least, based on who they've hired into it, including members of the team that worked on the Uncharted series, promises, hopefully, to actually have a solid Star Wars story in video game form. But so far, not so much outside of Uprising. Now, if it feels like this vlog has been a lot of bitching, in a sense, it has. Because as much as I love Star Wars, and as much as I do like a lot of the new products that are coming out, and I see great promise for the potential of this new continuity, particularly because of the new films and Rebels, it feels as though their approach to storytelling has drifted so far into the we-must-make-everything-character-focused, which shouldn't be a bad thing, that they've gotten away from scale, import, that is, importance, and a lot of the things that drew people in to the stories of the early Legends continuity, you know, the Thrawn trilogy, this was Star Wars because it felt like Star Wars. It had an epic scale. You had these great characterizations, and we were learning more about what has happened in the galaxy far, far away. We jumped in and gobbled it up. We're not getting that here. Character development, yes, but big events, bombastic stories... I really, really am afraid that some of the biggest events, they're just going to say, nope, that's a big event. We got to hold that for a movie. Or nope, that's a quasi big event. We got to hold that for Rebels. Can't tell a big event in a book or a comic that would hurt the potential for future box office grosses. Because it just sort of feels like their approach has shifted so far away from the epic that they've lost part of what made the Legends continuity so strong and so engaging early on. Again, it's no wonder that people who are diehard Legends fans are having trouble in some cases getting into this new stuff. I can get into it from the character side or the epic side, but I want both. Legends a lot of times focused on the epic side, but not that much on the characterization. A lot of characters felt like they didn't develop for many, many years because they were just the same characterizations over and over again, book after book. I can appreciate the new character depth that they're giving, especially on characters like Tarkin who really feel much more fleshed out than they ever did after decades of Legends. But you got to balance it and give us something bigger, too. Really. And Marvel, you seriously need to get your head out of your ass and stop thinking that you're the end-all and be-all of comics and everything you do is great and your shit don't stink, which I guess you would know if your head is that far up your colon most of the time. But you need to be able to step back and produce solid, quality Star Wars stories and just let that carry your success forward. You don't need to make everything a gimmick. You don't need the gimmicky crossovers. You don't need a hundred plus variant covers. You don't need this miniseries focusing on this character all hyped up only to turn out to be garbage like Chewbacca was. What you need is solid storytelling. If you write it, we will come. That is, we will come to the comic shops and buy it. I'm not leaning towards anything sexual there. I'm just saying that, you know, something's got to give. At some point, it can't just be the Star Wars name that drives profits. There has to be a quality underlying it, or you're undermining Star Wars as a whole. As for television, I think they're doing great things. I think they're doing terrific with Rebels. And from my perspective, I really enjoy what they're doing with the films. It seems like whenever Star Wars is put in video form, it's going gangbusters. But when Star Wars is in print, 
there are things lacking that we're hoping to see in the near future that we haven't really felt like we've gotten yet. And in video games, I, I don't want to say it's a lost cause for us to get a solid Star Wars story video game. I'm holding out hope for that visceral game, but it really feels as though they basically looked at it, uh, EA in particular, have basically looked at Star Wars as a license and said, you know what? We can make whatever we want. People are going to buy it. So, story? <laughs> no. That costs too much. Give us the same old multiplayer, throw in some new maps, give us some reskinned characters, like let's reskin that Rodian as Greedo, that Solistan as Nine No, throw them out there, call them heroes, and call it a day and rake in the money. I don't know. I don't feel as though EA so far, and to some extent the Disney mobile folks, but particularly EA, hasn't really shown our respect for the material or respect for the fans. When John Boyega is taking to Twitter, speaking to the creators of Battlefront, and wondering where the hell the story mode is, you've got problems. And fans now have an awesome advocate in the person of John Boyega. So if we're talking win or loss, movies, jury's still out, we haven't seen enough of them. I'm liking where they're going right now with story group canon so far. Television series? I think story group canon is winning thanks to Rebels. Books? I think Legend still has it. Character development and epic stories. Comic books? Same thing. I think Legend still has it right now. Video games? Legends all the way because there's just not much to it and not much there there for story group canon yet. But in terms of non-video games, gotta give those games the edge for the current line for fantasy fight games. I don't know that we've seen this strong a Star Wars non-video game product line ever in the life of the saga. But of course, that's just my opinion. Feel free to disagree. It is the voice of reason, or lack thereof. Maybe you think that this was the latter. Uh, as always, if you have questions you want me to explore here on the vlog, put them into the comments or shoot me an email, Nathan at StarWarsFanWorks.com. That's showing up there at the bottom of your screen right now. I will be back with another vlog, hopefully relatively soon. And uh, yeah, until then, May the Force be with you.